Charles Island Group MD and CEO EABL. Pleasure to be conducting this interview with you today. Thanks for the time. Oh, you're welcome, Ali Khan. Thank you. You're welcome. Charles, I, you know, I think, you, although you've been here, I think, is it five months? Yeah. yeah. For a lot of people, you're still a, a, a little bit of a new man on the block. Yeah. Uh, you came from Malaysia. Do you mind just giving us a bit of background? Yeah, I'd be delighted to. Yeah, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a two-company man. Yeah, I, uh, I joined Nestle as a management trainee back whenever it was, 20-something years ago, and uh, landed in the commercial function. Spent time in sales, marketing, a little bit of time in, um, in Veve, in the head office, but vast majority of the time was UK-based. And then after about 10 years, I joined Guinness Great Britain, um, just before the merger that created Diageo. What was that year? Because that was a That was 1997. Yeah. yeah, so I joined in November, mm. and Diageo was formed in December of 1997. I, st I joined as a sales director in the UK, uh, handling about a third of the business. And I worked in that role for 18 months before then going into a marketing role, from there into a global role and a global commercial role. And then I moved to Asia. So I spent 10 years in Asia in total. In KL? No, I'd started as managing director of Diageo Philippines yes. Incorporated. and. Uh, I was there for three years. My last year I was also commercial director for Asia Pacific because I didn't think I was quite busy enough. <laughs> and then from there I went to Malaysia to become the managing director of a joint venture business with Heineken, yes. uh, which was also, is also publicly listed. And I was uh, there for best part of seven years, six and a half years um, in Malaysia before being invited mm. to come to um, come to Kenya and run EABL, which is a great honor for me. Now, and I'm looking forward to talking to you about it. Yeah. Um, just a quick question. I mean, you know, everyone talks about uh, uh, the emergence of Asia and, uh, you know, this tremendous growth we saw out there. Do you see any correlations between what you saw in Asia and Africa, or are they totally different beasts, would you say? or? What, what's your perspective in the short period you've been here compared to what you saw over that decade in Asia? Yeah, so it's a great question. And I've got to say that having seen Asia and the development of Asia in the last 10 years, and I wasn't there right at the start of the development of Asia at all, but having seen the development of Asia over the last 10 years makes me incredible hope, incredibly hopeful for the development of Africa over the next 20 or 30 years. You know, having seen what's happened in Asia, I can look at Tanzania, Uganda, Kenya, South Sudan. You, you know, I can look at the region of East Africa and actually the wider continent and say there's 30 years of steady economic growth to be had out of this region. And it's lovely to be joining the business at this stage. Mm. I think you know, we have seen lots of inflows of, uh, of money into Africa as the quantitative easing around yes. the world has created, created cash and uh, it's found a home in Africa. Mm. Not a surprise to me at all. I look at the demographics, I look mm. at the way that uh, the continent set up and it's, uh, there's a bright future. So you, you very much think we're, we're on a cusp of an expanding... I do, yeah. I do. I, you know, I kind of look at, I look at the economies here in East Africa specifically and, and more broadly mm. across, across Africa. I, th I think you know, with one or two exceptions, you, we should be seeing unbroken growth for the next 10, 15, 20, 30 years mm. even. And uh, the transformation of the region will be incredible. Mm. Now, I can remember going to Kuala Lumpur 10 years ago, yes. and you know, that was a city of very few high rises. It had a very big twin towers. Yes, yeah, that was yeah, the tallest yeah, building. Once. Twin towers, mm. yep. Yeah. Um, but very few high rises. I, you, I go back now and there's, you know, there's uh, you know, dozens of them. Same will happen in Nairobi, absolutely certain of it. And Kampala and Dar and Kigali, it will happen. Great. Yeah. Now, Charles, can I jump to uh, the earnings release that we yes. saw on Friday? Yeah. Um, obviously, there were some big headline numbers in there. Yeah. There was a, uh, I, I think, full year revenue, which was up 6.375. Yeah. Percent was strong. I think yeah. you said 
volume plus three, price plus six. Yeah, about that, mm. about that. And you know, the, the big numbers for me, Ali Khan, mm. 59 billion shillings yes. net sales value. Yes. It's, it's a pretty big business, pretty uh, business. EABL. And uh, just a few shillings short of 15 billion at uh, mm. operating profit level, which was you know, also, also very nice. We're, yes. we're a big and meaty business. There are other numbers as well. Yes. So investment in our brands up 11 percent. Also, the the amount of tax we paid yes. um, increased by 13 percent to 43 billion yeah. shillings. Uh, so we're making a big contribution to the economies that we operate in and and to the government's uh, coffers. Can I just go back to a, a number of items which uh, sort of did not flatter this full year results when you yeah. look at it versus 2012. Yeah. Obviously, we're never going to repeat that one-off gain from the Serengeti, uh, f from the sale of the 20% stake in Tanzania Breweries. Yeah. Um, uh, and, one, and you have to strip that out. Uh, you're referring to the tax rate was much higher this time round. Yes, because last year we had some non-taxable items, mm. so it had the effect of suppressing our overall tax rate down to, I think it was a 27%, and, and then this year it was 38%, I think. So. We had a huge uh, jump in the effective tax rate, um, and of course, you know, we weren't going to be able to repeat those yes. those items that you referred to before. And you know, some commentators have focused their headlines on mm. the kind of the the bottom bottom result, yes. um, which you know I can understand, mm. but I kind of reorientate as towards, no, sure. you know, we've got a very solid business. Mm. We grew. Our volume, we grew our revenue, mm. our profit was about flat. And if you look at the items in between those, we sent, spent six billion shillings on capital investments yeah. during the year, setting the business up for, for success for the future. We spent an extra 11% mm. on, uh, on marketing and sales activities. We increased our sales force mm. headcount by 20% in the year our direct coverage of outlets by 30% during the year. So you know, we are investing mm. significant amounts of time, resources and cash to set this business up, to be well positioned mm. to access the future growth that we were just talking about. Yeah. And I think I, what I found was, I think, you know, you've been in existence at EABL for like nearly a century. Yeah, 1922, right That's back right. there. It's yeah, it's quite, it's quite a long it's time. A long I think time. a lot of people have got very used to an unleveraged balance sheet, a business that was throwing yeah. off cash. Yeah. And it seems to me that in the last few years, you've made a decision to double down on growth more. And that's obviously crimped earnings in the short term. Is that, would you describe it like that? Look, I think that's the way that it's it's played out in mm. in the last couple of years. Um, I think that uh, you know it's clear when you look at our results that we the last couple of years have been in you know big investment years, um, but the underlying performance is is very steady, and you know we are very keen to get back to a level of growth that will delight the shareholders. So we're we're digesting the. Tanzania a acquisition. We're investing in infrastructure and uh, efficiencies in the business, so that um, so that we can manage our cost base well and we can meet the the uh, volume demands and uh, requirements of our different markets. And one of the reasons I'm here is to help ensure that we've got the best possible programs throughout our business, so that we can get good good levels of growth. By good levels of growth, I mean um, probably uh, high single digits or low double digit volume, mm -hmm. and then gearing throughout mm -hmm. the P&L so that we've got significantly more than that fin coming out of the bottom. Is, is, is that what you're projecting? Like a it's not what we're projecting. It's yes. what I'm aiming for. Aim and uh, you know, I, th I think we shy away from giving mm. pro no projections. Sure. Uh, but that's, yeah. that's, that, that's good growth because I mean you would expect some multiplier effect from prices as well. Yeah, so I I think that you know, a healthy business is always gear that ge uh, have gearing across the P and L. So you know volume at one level, um, pricing at the next level, and then profitability at the next level. And you know I expect that we'll be we'll be delivering that here in the ABL. 
one more technical question. Yeah. Um, obviously, the bank borrowing has increased yeah. substantially, 19.5 billion, I think, still outstanding yeah. to Diageo on T bills plus one and a yeah, half. half yeah, that and that, uh, looking through, and plus there was, I think, a little bit more leverage on as you financed your capex uh, it, it, uh, to some degree. Um, looking at that, the interest, uh, the absolute cost of that came down this year, didn't it? Because interest rates came a little bit lower, or I'm not sure when your rate was fixed for the one-year loan with Diageo. Yeah, so, so the loan rate with Diageo actually changed over the last year, 18 months, yes. uh, to reflect uh, a competitive market rate. Um, and it's T-bill 364 plus one and a half percent, as you, as you said. I think our overall um, interest charges for the year actually went up. Yes. Uh, in but not hugely, I didn't it, find it. It was. Uh, uh, and Tracy Burns, who's a group FD, mm -hmm. and I and others are working hard to make sure that our borrowings are structured in, in a way that uh, is appropriate given our long-term ambitions and uh, our long-term kind of cash generation forecasts. Uh, so we're kind of working on the whole mix. But realistically speaking, we're going to be carrying this uh, uh, this sort of leverage ratio. Because I know there's a question came up um, in the, on Friday's earnings release when I was there. Somebody saying, you know, your debt to equity ratios ticked up. Are you going to bring it down? But I, I thought I would have thought it doesn't make sense to bring it down. You're betting on growth. You need that kind of borrowing capacity, or is that incorrect? Uh, we're working on making sure that our overall balance sheet is optimized, yes. and you know, there are there are several different ways, several different levers to pull. Um, don't want to kind of go into too many details and set any hairs running. Yes. Uh, but I think that you know, our long-term strategy is kind of well uh, communicated that we are setting the business up for long-term success so that we can capture our fair proportion and more of the future growth in in this region and we've made strategic acquisitions and we've made strategic uh, capital investments mm -hmm. in order to access that i don't think we're going to be going back from that strategy um, now that, that's that was my impression yeah. now looking uh, if i can geographically yeah. i mean eabl uh, covers the eac plus south sudan and I believe Eastern DRC under yeah. the new market. So yeah. it's, it's quite a, a big uh, geographical expanse. Yeah. Kenya is still 67% of revenue, is that correct? Yeah. So really it's the beer business which is r the core franchise. Yeah, so it, look, if we kind of look yeah. into Kenya, Kenya this year was 67% yes. of our net sales revenue. Um, so two thirds of the business um, centered on you know, where we're at now in, in Nairobi. And given the history that you referred to, founded in 1922, the huge Tusker brand, mm. Kenya Kane, that, that, uh, that are the backbones of, of our business here. Um, probably not surprising um, that it's the biggest contributor to our business. Um, probably about two thirds of our business is, is, in, is beer. Yes. Two thirds. Yeah, yeah uh, around there. So Which is unusual in, within the Diageo empire, is it not? Yeah. So if we if we look at kind of Diageo uh, globally, Diageo center of gravity is in spirits. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, in Diageo, I think I'm right in saying that EABL is its biggest beer business mm -hmm. in terms of absolute number of units sold. We've got five breweries. We've got kind of a network of breweries, network of um, a number of different countries uh, that the EABL has uh, uh, territorial rights over. So, and and the biggest one is is Kenya, about two thirds beer across Tusker, White Cap, Belosi, Pilsner, uh, Tusker Malt, Tusker Light, Tusker Light. Then we've got. Snap and Smirnoff Ice, and in the presentation on Friday, I kind of showed the makeup of our business territorially. I also then showed the makeup of our business across the different segments of beer and segments of spirits, and our absolute star performer yes, across the whole of the business last year, from a 
from a segment of market perspective was our, what we call our reserve spirits. Yes. So the very high priced spirits, yeah. the Cirox, Johnny Walker Blue Label, the Tanker A10s. What, why did you tell people what the year on year? Uh, 278, 76, 78% yes. growth I think it was. Now granted that's off a relatively low base, mm. probably a few few million or few tens of millions of shillings, not hundreds mm. of millions of shillings of, uh, of base business. But what it does show us is the tremendous potential that this region has got. Uh, reserve spirits around the world have been a big growth engine for Diageo. And we've been working to make sure that we're established mm. as the market becomes mature enough to, for consumers to be meaningfully accessing uh, that, type of, uh, that type of product and uh, we were really pleased with our performance across reserve last year. But when you look at that uh, trend of premiumization of people demanding better and better quality drinks, yeah. we saw this very much in Asia. Every time I look at sort of buyers of single malts, there's always some Asian yeah. buyer. Yeah. So I suppose we, one expects the same trend to play out here or? Yeah, we do. Yes, we do, quite frankly. And you know, when I went to Asia 10 years ago, in fact, more than 10 years ago when I was in the global role, <coughs> I was astounded when I walked into a bar or a club and I saw on dozens of different tables full bottles of spirits. I'd never really seen that as a kind of a Brit because um, full bottle drinking yeah. does, didn't really happen in the UK while I was no. kind of a, a young man. So they're buying the bottle for the table and then sharing it on the table? Buying the bottle for the table and sharing it with maybe some mixers yes. and, and what, what have you. And, uh, and I went into a nightclub in Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam 10, 12 years ago and I saw this nightclub, it may ha maybe had 200 of the cocktail type tables yes. all in this big a area with a live band in one, kinda at one, one end. And across the tables, just about every table had a bottle of Johnny Walker Blue Label on it. Just incredible kind of consumption of premium spirits. Now I'm not sure that you know we'll kind of get to that level yes. of consumption or that amount of kind of conspicuous consumption, mm. which is big in Asia, yes. um, in the short or even medium term uh, in Africa. But sure as eggs are eggs, as the economies in this region mature and there's an emerging middle class and then there's an emergence of kind of more broad scale wealthy uh, population than there is at the moment. People will start drinking premium spirits in quantities that they're not now in the same that they'll have tailor-made suits <laughs> and they'll have uh, <laughs> and they'll have uh, Swiss watches and you know and, and uh, you know, fancy sedan cars and all of that sort of stuff. It will come, absolutely. So getting back to the territory yes. stuff. So Kenya, Kenya was a very steady performer for us last year, 10% net sales growth. Yeah, and that, that includes volume plus price, right? When you say net sales? Uh, yes, yeah, so yeah. volume plus price. Uh, because I, I, I noticed you had two price increases which happened towards the end of the full year cycle. They did. So our first one was around March, mm. I think implemented maybe in April. And then the second one actually happened after the year end. It, ha it happened at the start of July. As we've kind of, kind of got to manage the full P&L, yes. got to understand kind of the investments that we're making and kind of the costs that escalation and utilities and, and what have you. And then, you know, we took a and a serious look at our pricing and decided that the right thing to do was to, to pass some of the costs on to consumers. And someone said to me that, you know, we had two price increases in four months. And you know, I suppose technically that's true. But you could also look at it and you could say we had two prices in 24 months yes. because we hadn't had one mm. for two years before. And actually, we're probably not going to have one for a good period of time in the next few months. So it might be two price increases in 30 months or whatever by the, by the time we get round to the next one. But it looks as if 67% or whatever revenue is predominantly in beer is well, well positioned for the full year going forward now. Yeah, you know, we've got to be kind of mindful of the consumer and making sure that we're, we work hard to distribute our brands, that we give them 
you know the right levels of advertising and promotion and other and kind of full marketing support and we've got to work hard uh, to kind of deliver the level of performance that we're aiming for and we've got big campaigns happening uh, the the uh, English Premier League has just yes, restarted huge, and that's yeah. sponsored by Guinness we've got uh, Tusker Project Fame just about to happen we've that's got a tent off that's in a big way. so we've got that we've got a activities on Bailey's and Johnny Walker and Kenya Kane coming up so we're going to be working hard to ensure that our brands are relevant for consumers and and do a good job for our customers and so that we we have continued success in the marketplace can I just throw in something yeah of course you know, there was a lot of uh, talk around competitor challenge yes we've had a lot of new entrants lots of people yeah. spending money um, how would you characterize that that for us for the Kenya business? I mean, I remember the last time it happened, uh, EABL sort of draped itself in the Kenyan flag, and it yeah. was extremely effective. Yeah. Uh, is that something that you would consider, or I mean, how do you view the competitor landscape right now? Uh, yeah, great question. Look, I, first of all, let me say that. Yeah, EABL is a wonderful business. You know, long heritage in Kenya. And obviously, we're kind of pan-region now, but long heritage in Kenya. We've done some, you know, um, some great work in Kenya, bringing water to communities, providing employment both directly and indirectly through our supply chain, through the distribution network. Been investing consistently in our company and in our brands and in Kenya. Mm. And therefore, it's no surprise to me that, Ken that uh, EABL is a much loved company within Kenya mm. and that uh, Kenyans quite rightly feel like you know, EABL is part of, part of yeah, their so. kind of culture, part of their heritage, and uh, are very defensive of, kind of, um, of its position. And I wasn't around at the time, but I've heard stories about what happened. And you know, when we made a call to Kenyans mm. to kind of support their company, Kenyans responded in a way that they should be really, really, really proud of. Um, the competitive landscape now, yeah, it's, it's interesting, mm. right? So if we go back to what we were talking about um, just at the start of the conversation, you know, Africa is the place to be in the way that maybe Asia was 10 years ago. It is Africa's decade. Mm. I am certain of it. In fact, probably Af Africa's tri-decade. Mm. I don't know whether they've got a word for it, years. but next 30 years. And that makes it interesting mm. for multinational consumer goods companies. And I've heard a lot about those companies finding, mm. you know, finding their way to Nairobi maybe better late than never <laughs> but you know they found their way here they've established i read a report recently about some company bragging that they've set up an office in nairobi now mm. and what have you <laughs> might be 90 years too late you yes. never know but so there is competition multinational corporation there are you know there are other brewers who have been trying to kind of establish a foothold in this market and there are you know local companies as well which have have been working very hard to um, to build their market position. So, yes, there is comp competition. You could say that it's intense. You could say that you know, the, the competitors are striving uh, to try and kind of establish a business for themselves. A couple of thoughts from me. First of all, I think competition is healthy. You know, I'm a businessman. I'm a kind of capitalist. You know, I believe in free markets. And I kind of, I believe that companies like ours are stimulated mm. by having mm. other businesses to compete against. I don't know whether That's you know, but I play golf and yes. I, I love keeping score. Yes. I love keep, <laughs> keeping score against myself. What's your handicap, by the way? 11. Uh, <laughs> well, I say that because I'd love it to be nine. And my, my son's hand, handicap is six. And, oh, you know, nice. I'd love to uh, be able to give him a good game. But look, I love playing golf against myself and kind of scoring mm. well. But actually, I find it even more enjoyable when I'm playing against competition. So, you know, I believe in competition. Um, so, you know, I think that that's kind of kind of healthy for us as a business, and it's healthy for the market. The other thing is that, you know, when a when a business which might have 0.1 percent market share invests in their premium beer, then you know that makes 
that helped consumers in Kenya reappraise what they think about premium, what, what premium means. It helps them kind of reappraise. And we, we have found, as I showed, showed in the presentation on, uh, on Friday, we found that our premium beers are growing at a faster I rate. They were growing very fast. Yeah, are growing at a faster rate than, um, uh, than other brands in our portfolio. Mm. So, um, so uh, you know, I think that uh, maybe what the competition is doing is it's helping boost our performance. Yes. Uh, now, I'm not saying that I'm, you know, really content that their level of performance is where it is, or that uh, that you know EABL feels secure in its position. Quite the contrary. Uh, we are using competition as a way of focusing the team and focusing our minds on driving this great business even harder to grow it to the next level of performance. And. Uh, uh, and I wish the competition well, <laughs> and uh, in the same way oh, that, no. um, <laughs> that I wish Manchester United well tonight, but I hope Chelsea beat them. <laughs> <laughs> Last question on Kenya. Senator yeah. Beer, which, was, which yeah. was, I think, in some respects, not a purely a commercial decision, was it? Or, you know, was it one where you were trying to sort of do something about the informal market? Or how would you characterize Senator? Because I know you've got this tax issue coming up how does can you yeah. just so yeah good so um oh, senator beer is you know we're a commercial business uh but senator beer was not launched as a commercial proposition senator beer or senator keg as it's called here was launched as a, a corporate responsibility initiative in partnership with the kenyan government and I wasn't here when it was launched, but it was launched at a time where there was great, great concern that people were falling ill and indeed dying Many. in significant numbers mm. as a result of drinking alcohol that had been illicitly brewed or created, produced in somebody's backyard in a bucket. Mm. And in partnership with the Kenyan government, we developed Senator Keg. Uh, we limited its distribution into only areas and outlets where there were more economically challenged consumers. And we put a whole business infrastructure around it. So we, we spent well over a billion shillings on the kegs, the systems and processes. We put up a dedicated network for those. We trained and brought retailers into the formal sector where they're now paying VAT and making other contributions um, as a result of this CR activity. Um, we were never promised a kind of a, um, a, uh, a perennial uh, arrangement by the government, um, but um, it was a shock and somewhat of a blow when we heard in the budget that uh, the uh, excise tax is now going to be applied mm. to senator um, look we're a commercial business and we do make some money out of um, of uh, senator um, and you know, we do sell it in a commercially viable way we sell it in a commercially viable way partly so that we can p pay for the infrastructure that I talked to you about, the 13,000 outlets, the training and the development of them to produce a good quality, legitimate alcohol that economically challenged consumers can choose to turn to if they feel that there are too many risks in drinking illicit alcohol. Um, so we do make some money out of it. but. Really, it's far, first and foremost, always has been, and always will be, a CR activity. And I'm really worried that, um, that consumers will turn back to illicit alcohol and that, um, uh, that that will have a negative impact on the nation's health. And I've asked the team to make sure that we keep a close monitor on it and we make sure that we're fully reporting what the health impact has been as a result of that excise tax increase. Now from an EABL perspective, 
you, you know, your viewers and you know, my shareholders might be interested to understand what the financial impact is going to be for EABL. Well, I think as with anything, as with any disruptive changes that happen in the market, if you do nothing about it, it's going to have a big impact. Um, uh, and similarly, I think excise tax introduction on Senator, I think, will drive down volumes of Senator. Any idea well, you know, we've gained different numbers, and I don't want to kind of share because it's a little bit commercially sensitive. But you know. Um, you know, we have gained different numbers and we do think that it will have a, an impact on the volume. But we're going to take some steps to mitigate that impact. So we've got some innovations coming up. And, by the way, you know, when kind of your market is threatened, you become even more competitive in the marketplace. <laughs> so, you know, so I've worked that out about you. <laughs> so we kind of, kind of go back to that thing about it's nice that we've got some competitors in the market because we can go after their business a little bit harder <laughs> to try and recover some of ours.